Happy Sabbath, Church. So today, we will speak about the patience and faith of the saints. And Bill was apologizing for using my scripture in Sabbath school. But I tell him, no, God works in ways where he wants to reinforce messages. So you might hear a little here and a little there. So the patience and faith of his saints. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your care. We thank you for your love. And as we come to review a bit of your message to us, we pray that your spirit will teach us and guide us. O oh Lord, may your spirit fall upon us. May your spirit do things to us that we never dreamed he could do. May we be drawn closer to you. May we be prepared for the challenges that will come. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount made a very interesting teaching about how we should conduct our lives. He says, therefore, if I say to you, therefore, what? I say to you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air for they neither sow nor eat nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Mm -hmm. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Here Jesus is telling the people how they should live their lives. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is. Telling people how we should live. And here in this, Jesus is saying, people of little faith worry too much about tomorrow. People of little faith worry too much about tomorrow. And in our daily living, we should not worry. Do not worry about your life, Jesus says. Don't worry. But even more importantly is the question about what will happen in the end of time. I mean, we live today and we go about and we worry and we get along. But what happens when trouble comes? How will that affect us? Revelation 13.10 is from the chapter of the Bible with the mark of the beast. It speaks of this great tribulation that will come upon the earth and people will be killed for their faith. And here, the New King James says, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So our sermon title is the patience and the faith of the saints. And the English Standard Version says, here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Revelation, by the way, for those of you who have heard that it is a closed book, that's rubbish. Revelation is a revealing 
God is revealing his love and his grace and his mercy. And he's also revealing that will come upon the earth. And he's saying, is this going to happen? There's no doubt about it. All these troubles will go to happen. And here is a call for you, the saints, to have endurance and faith. Now, if you live your ordinary daily lives with worries, how are you going to endure in the end? Consider that question. What is patience? What is faith? Why do the saints need patience? Why do the saints need faith? How do we develop these? Those are some questions. Patience. The Greek word hupomone, steadfastness, constancy, endurance. In the New Testament, the characteristic of a person who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. That's one of the definitions for patience. You are not swerved from your deliberate purpose, your loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. So in the great tribulation, we need to have patience. We need to have endurance. So a patience is a patient, steadfast, waiting for whatever we are waiting for. It is a patient, enduring, sustaining perseverance for whatever we are waiting for. That's what the Bible means when it calls for patience. It's steadfastness, endurance, constancy. And God is saying in the end times, we have to have that. But guess what? You don't get it if you don't build your faith now. So that is why in your daily living, you need to stop your worrying. In our daily living, we need to have faith. In our regular lives now, we need to build faith. Because when the great tribulation comes upon this earth, you won't be raptured out of it. If you have heard that teaching, we'll talk about that another time. In the days of Noah, Noah wasn't raptured out of the flood. He was in an ark, but he was in the flood. And Jesus says, as in the days of Noah were, so shall be when the Son of Man comes. The Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. And faith, faith is the substance of things so far, the evidence of things not seen. Faith basically saying, I'm open for things. I haven't seen it yet, but I believe it. I know I got it. I haven't seen it. I haven't experienced it. But I do know I have it. And then verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. That's God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Sometimes you ask God for things. You're not getting it because you're not diligent. Sometimes you ask for things and you don't get it because you doubt. James says, let not that person who thinks he asks and doubt will get anything. You are unst unstable as the waters. So when you are seeking things from God, you must not waver. You must not doubt. You must continue to press. You must continue to endure. You must believe that you will receive it. And you must not be shaken even if the answer does not come in the time frame that you want. That's what the Bible means about faith. It's not simply, oh, I believe there is a God and you are safe. No, 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 no. God is saying you need to have a different type of faith. It's a trust, an enduring trust. So in Revelation 14, there is this big warning called the three angels message about not getting the mark of the beast. And at the end, it says, here is the patience of the saints. They are not in heaven. They are not being translated away out of all this trouble. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. By the way, the saints are those who keep God's commandments and have the faith of Jesus. 
So those who teach you about the commandments being done away with, they are not saints. Now we will talk about that. So there is a problem. Will we, will Jesus find faith when he comes on this earth? In Luke 18, 78, Jesus told a, 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 a story about a persistent widow. In Luke chapter 18, from verse 1, there was a widow who kept going to this unjust judge and said, deliver me from my adversary. And the unjust judge will not give her justice. But she kept pressing and pressing and pressing. And finally, the judge said, I don't really care about God or man or this woman. I don't, I don't have concern about her affairs. But if, if I don't give her justice, she's going to wear me out. So let, let me just get her off my case by doing what she asking for. And she just said, you see that? Look at that. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? It's not every time you're going to get a quick answer. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Hello? Will he really find faith on the earth? good question to ask because if jesus said that then i ought to take stock of myself i can't give you faith and you can't give me faith god gives each of us faith but we have to develop that faith will he really find faith on the earth so we have a history lesson to study in all of this to get an understanding of where we can fall flat and where we do fall flat and how we shall not fall flat if we want to have that faith that Jesus looks for on the earth. Notice now, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 11. I will not read all those verses, but moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. Who remembers the cloud? The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Yes, all passed through the sea. Where was that now? When they go through the Red Sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. What was that food? The manna that fell from heaven. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was? Christ. Yeah, it was Christ in the Old Testament. In case you didn't know. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now notice what he says in verse 6. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things. Now I really want to get off right now. You know there are some people who let me just pick a few I'm not picking on anybody. A man says you know what I'm, I want a wife. Yeah. But I'm a Christian. And the Bible tells me don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Oh. But you see this voluptuous <laughs> siren, a vixen, walking and bopping and weaving. <laughs> and his heart goes, Oh, Elizabeth, I'm coming. And lo and behold, he goes after her. But she's not even a Christian. No. So, you know, he's lusting after evil things right now. A woman wants a husband. And she's in the church. Yeah. And she don't wait on God. I said, Lord, I've been praying for years and years and I can't get a husband. I'm going to take that man. That the Bible tells us to do. We need to wait on God. But she goes and takes this man who does all sorts of evil things. The Bible said these things became our examples. And then in verse 11, now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for who? For them? For our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come, the kingdoms upon whom the ends of the world have come. What does that tell us about the Old Testament? It was written to teach us. So when somebody tells you that the Old Testament is not relevant, Tell them, doctrine of devils. Don't give me that lie. 
The Bible says the record of the Hebrews was written to teach me how to live in these times. That's what he's saying. Don't be unaware of what happened to the people of Israel because they were written to instruct us. We shouldn't lust after evil things. We should remember that we are following after God just like how they were. And if we deviate from what God is asking us, then God is not going to be well pleased with us. We need to remember that. After being delivered from Egypt, and after seeing the Egyptian soldiers drowned, the people of Israel went traveling in the wilderness. And from the Red Sea, the host of Israel again set forth on a journey under the guidance of the pillar of cloud. Now where they were going? In the wilderness. The scene around them was most dreary, bare, desolate looking mountains, barren plains, the sea stretching far away. The shores of the sea were strewn with the bodies of the dead Egyptians. They were full of joy because they were free. And they weren't discounted then, but let's what happens. It's all in Exodus 15, and there was this great song that Miriam led out with. They were rejoicing when the Egyptians died. Then so Moses, from verse Exodus 15, 22 to 27, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. How long did they go? Three days. Now when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. And the people, what? Complained against Moses. That's where they started complaining. What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. What does that tell you about God? He can provide for your needs in the most dismal of circumstances. As long as you are following God, what are you going to worry about? Then he made a statute and an ordinance for them. There he did what? He tested them and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. From the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, so they camped there by the waters. Listen, you know that people have found the Egyptian mummies. Mm -hmm. And when they looked, their bodies were well preserved. And they did x-ray photography. And what did they find? What the Egyptians were dying from were things like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, all of these modern day lifestyle diseases. They know that for sure. They're able to see the traces in their body. And God is saying, listen to me. If you follow me, you won't get that type of stuff. And so they followed God. How, how long did they follow God in the wilderness? All right. And we know what happened. But guess what? They were walking in the wilderness. And the store of provisions had now begun to fall. There was scanty vegetation. The flocks were diminishing. How was food to be supplied for these vast multitudes? Doubts filled their heart and again they murmured. So Exodus 16, 1 to 3, and they journeyed from Elim and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin which is between Elim and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Not very long. 15th day of the second month, a month and a half. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. I hear what they said. Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the pots of meat and we when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Was that a reasonable <laughs> complaint? No. How long were they following the Lord? A month and a half. Not long. 
The day they left Egypt was the beginning of their year. So they were there the 15th day of the second month, a month and a half. They had not just yet suffered from hunger. All their present wants were supplied, but they feared for the future. They were not hungry. They could not understand how these vast multitudes were to maintain or support themselves, especially at a minimal level in their travels through the wilderness. In imagination, they saw their children starving. But the Lord had permitted difficulties to surround them. He allowed the supply of their food to be cut short, that their hearts might turn to him who had thus far been their deliverer. Notice what he wanted. If in their need they would call upon him, he would give, give them evident tokens of his love and care. He was the one who fetched them out of Egypt. He had promised that if they would obey his commandments, no disease would come upon them. It was therefore sinful and unbelief on their part to anticipate that they or their children might die of hunger. It was, un it was ungodly, sinful, sinful unbelief to be complaining and murmuring that God is bringing them out in the wilderness to kill them, that they should have been left in Egypt. Question is, are we any different? God had promised to be their God, to take them to himself as a people, to lead them to a large and good land. That was the promise. But they were what? Ready to faint at every obstacle encountered in the way to that land. In a marvelous manner, he had brought them out from their bondage in Egypt. That he might ennoble them and elevate them and make them a praise in the earth. But it was necessary for them to encounter difficulties and to encounter endure hardships. Why? They were coming out of Egypt. They were coming out as slaves. They were there a long time. They didn't even know much about God. They didn't have a concept of faith. They were used to being told to do this and do that. Do this, make these bricks and you live. Don't make the bricks and you die. They had to just jump at the command of their slave masters. Now God wants to elevate them. God wants to ennoble them. God actually wanted to dwell among them. But God also wanted to restore the image of God in them. And God don't want slaves. God want people who had an enduring trust in him. So what is the purpose of difficulties and hardships? Is to let them stop and say, you know what? I can't tell what's going to happen tomorrow. But I have seen what the Lord has done. And no matter what comes my way, I must believe, I must accept that the Lord is good. And no evil will he may come upon me. And that is what he said to them. If you obey me, I will let none of the diseases of Egypt came upon, come upon you. He made a promise before. But there were people who only could think of their belly. They could only think of today. And they were only worrying about tomorrow. And they were not looking at God as their provider, as their deliverer. They were not looking at God as a sustainer of life. They were not looking at God as being able to do all and beyond what they could ask or imagine. And this concept of difficulties and hardships 
was going to force them to open their eyes to see God in a new light. And to not be slaves to all that they had cultivated in Egypt. God was bringing them from a state of degradation to fit them to occupy an honorable place among the nations to receive important and sacred truths. That's why he built the sanctuary to teach them to teach the world about the, 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 the process of salvation. They would have cheerfully borne convenience if they had faith in God. They would have cheerfully borne deprivation. They would have cheerfully borne even real suffering. Remember I told you the text in Revelation? The Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. This calls for patient endurance of the saints. What God is telling us is there is coming a time when if we don't have it, we're not going to make it. We need to develop it from now. But they were unwilling to trust the Lord any further than they could witness the continual evidences of his power. They were not willing to trust the Lord until they could see it before their very eyes. But, but, but faith is the substance of things, what? The evidence of things not seen. But they wanted to see it. But without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So what God is saying, I don't want you to trust what you can see. I want you to understand that if you diligently seek me, I will reward you in due time. Not as you open your mouth and say, give me this Lord I'm giving you. That's not faith. That's not faith. If you want to please God, you must diligently seek God and believe that God will reward you in his time. So you apply for a job and you don't get it. Just wait. You're looking for a wife and she don't get her yet. Just wait. You're looking for a husband and he doesn't come along yet. Just wait. It may be that God don't see anybody good for you. And you're better off not with anybody. Or it may be that you are the problem. Oh yeah. <laughs> don't think so. And God needs to rub out the, the rubbish out of your lives before he let you descend on anybody. Amen. Because you might just go and make yourself a misery yeah. in other people's lives. Yes, Lord. Yes. 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 Is that your God love? God love everybody. Yeah. So God is not going to turn you on like a plague onto somebody else. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But we must. Don't laugh. You make me laugh. Sure. We must believe that God is working in his time. Yeah. Now we must trust the Lord. So they grumbled. They forgot. Listen to what they forgot. They forgot their bitter service in Egypt. They wanted to go back. They forgot the goodness and power of God displayed in their behalf in their deliverance from bondage. They forgot how their children had been speared when the destroying angels slew all the firstborn of Egypt. They also forgot that Pharaoh had given the command to kill all the boys. They forgot the grand, grand exhibition of divine power at the Red Sea when God caused that sea to part and they crossed through the sea on dry land. They forgot that while they had crossed safely in the path there that had been opened for them, the armies of the enemies attempting to follow them had been overwhelmed by the waters of the sea. All they could see and feel was their present 
inconvenience and trials. Instead of saying God has done great things for us, whereas we're slaves and he's making us of a great nation, they spoke of the hardness of the way and wondered when their weary pilgrimage would end. So many people say they are Christians and all they do, they grumble and groan and moan and complain. Oh, I am suffering. Oh, things are rough. Oh, nothing good is happening in my life. Liar! God is giving you breath. God is saving you from your sins. God is transforming you. God is with you. Oh, you mean nothing good? Isn't God good? God is in your life. Then don't say nothing good is happening in my life. Oh, yes. We will go through trials. Through much tribulation, we must enter into the kingdom of God. When people say, what's going on? The first thing you say, God is good. Practice that. What's happening in your life? God is good. I might not see all the answers yet to what I ask for, but God is good. That's how you must practice to answer people. Let not one murmur or grumble or complain come out of your mouth. Because if God is with you, who can be against you? If God is good and God is with you, why is it that we give the people of the world an impression that we are following after a hard taskmaster? Why is it that we think that we give people the idea that our yoke is heavy and our burden is wearing us down? And we ain't come to the great tribulation yet. Why is it that we forget the many instances when the Lord has delivered us? So notice at the end of the 40 years, notice what Moses said, Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 5. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Notice what? To humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. By the way, for those of you who don't know, go back and look at Exodus 16. Exodus 16, when God started to rain the manna down from heaven, he said, I'm going to test them if they will keep my commandments or not. Six days, this manna will fall. And you go out six days and pick up the manna. Don't pick up too much. And don't try to store anything over because I will provide for tomorrow. Don't you try to store up for tomorrow. I will give you tomorrow. And some people go out and collect extra money. <laughs> I don't trust the Lord. I better grab the food I can get today. He's not going to give me any tomorrow. I don't believe him. They might not have said those very words, but that's exactly what they mean. And the man of bread worms and stank. But the Lord says, on the Sabbath day, you don't go out and collect any. Collect a double portion on Friday, and it will be all right. Amen. And when they did, the manna never spoiled. Mm -hmm. And for 40 years, they had the miracle of the manna. Mm -hmm. It fell only six days. And if you take up any extra portion, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth day, it's going to spoil. Yes. If you took up the extra portion on the sixth day, yes. it, done, it did not spoil. Forty years the manna fell. What does that say? God can provide for your needs. And will. And will. Thank you very much. Blessed be the Lord, oh my soul. So, led you all these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether would he would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know your fathers. No, that he might make you know that what? Man shall not live by bread alone, but, by, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Your garments did not wear out on you, 
nor did your foot swell these 40 years. In other words, you didn't get sick. You didn't get high blood pressure. You didn't get high heart disease. You didn't get diabetes. You didn't get heart attack. You didn't get any of these things. You went in. Even your very clothes didn't wear out. Not just your bodies, but even the very things you have on, on your back. You know, like I have clothes from the 80s. And my wife like to want to throw them out. Well, see, God, keep the children of Israel close for 40 years. Leave my clothes alone. <laughs> Nor did your foot swell these 40 years. No problems. So what does that teach us about God? We don't need to worry about tomorrow. Man shall not live by bread alone. Don't worry about your retirement. You know there's going to come a time when all that you have will be taken away. Your house will be taken away. Your cars will be taken away. All the things that you, assets that you store up. And by the way, as somebody mentioned, the Ukrainians were gathering up all these things, living their lives and didn't know that tomorrow bombs would be raining down and there are no refugees having nothing. Who knows what will happen? It may be that a foreign nation does not attack us, but guess what? There could be an earthquake. There could be a severe blizzard, 15 feet of snow. There could be storms galore. There could be tornadoes. There could be wildfires. Everything can come. The banks can collapse and fail. Why do you put your trust in these things? Bible is talking about the patience and faith of the saints. So Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will, he shall, he certainly will, he will not fail, he will direct your paths. That is why when Jesus spoke the Sermon on the Mount, he said, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. Because he didn't want the children of Israel to do that. Because he gave them food day by day. He didn't have to give them to store up in the bank. He didn't have to give them to hoard it somewhere. In fact, they were traveling anyway. And if they bury it, they'll probably never come back that way again. God is saying, trust me. Do you know in the, in the great tribulation, when the plagues are showing out on this earth, nothing that you store up will be food, good for food. But the Bible promises us in Isaiah 33, bread shall be given. Did you want to be sure? Think about Elijah. Elijah was fed by a raven. Elijah never had to worry about anything. Think about Noah. He built that ark. He invested everything he had. Because what? The whole earth was going to be destroyed. Could he be trying to say, Lord, leave this plot of land. Don't let the flood take over my land. No. He trusted in the Lord. The patience and the faith of the saints. If we are going to make it to the end of time, tomorrow is not our priority. Our priority is to trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn.